Hello, I'm Pastor Matthew Coleman from First Baptist Church in Clay Center, Kansas, and I welcome you to today's Ministry Minute where we're continuing our exploration of the epistle, the letter, that Jesus' half-brother Jude wrote to a congregation to encourage them as they interacted with a false teacher, or actually a group of false teachers. Today we're looking at the 13th verse of Jude, which says, which describing these false teachers, describes them as raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Yesterday we looked at a couple other ways that these uh, certain men, which Jude described them, um, other ways that he had described them. For example, he described them as clouds without rain and trees without fruit. And here he talks about them as raging waves and wandering stars. As we think about these descriptions, there's a couple things that we want to recognize. First, in this idea of the raging waves, well, one thing when we think about these false teachers, uh, you know, as believers, we often talk about the firm foundation that we have as a result of placing our faith in Jesus Christ. We even sing that song about the wise man and the foolish man and how they build their house and the wise man built his house upon the rock and the foolish man built his house upon the sand. And as we think about that, it says the rains came down and the floods came up and the, the wise man's house stood firm and the foolish man's house went splat. And so as we think about these raging waves of the sea, the idea is that as these individuals follow false doctrine, as they promote and teach and advance a doctrine that is not true, um, they are experiencing and they are living in uh, instability. And you know, we, as we continue to go through uh, this pandemic, we all understand the idea of uncertainty. Um, but this is the idea that is going on behind, uh, that Jude is trying to express, that these people, uh, they are unstable in their doctrine. And you know, have you ever known somebody that believed something that wasn't true? It's not long before they have to change their beliefs because they find out, well, what I'm saying isn't really true, so I have to adjust it in order to accommodate the truth. Um, and so this first idea is that they are raging waves of the sea, is that they're unstable in their doctrine. And how unfortunate is that? You know, I have known people uh, that have uh, had huge waves and uh, uh, waves in their thinking. At, at one point they believed one thing doctrinally and then shifted it to a position that was almost entirely the opposite. Uh, now, of course, sometimes that's a good thing if you're going from a false teaching to a, a, the correct teaching, the truth. But again, uh, just imagine the instability of that, the uncertainty of that. And so that's what we see in this first idea. The second idea about foaming out their own shame, of course, that's connected with the idea of the waves and the waves as they turn and the instability uh, and the fury of the waves. It um, churns up this foam. And one of the idea about this is foaming out their own shame is that, you know, sometimes people, uh, as they live their lives, you know, it's that old expression, you can fool some of the people some of the time, uh, and or all of the people some of the time, uh, and so the idea here is, even though these false teachers, they were trying um, to, to present themselves in a certain way, even though they, they were pretending uh, in a certain way, eventually the truth will be known. And again, that's one of the ideas that Jude is trying to get across to these people, these believers, as they're dealing with the false teachers. But the idea is that the wickedness, uh, the, the outrageous uh, behavior of these individuals that were trying to lead this congregation astray, uh, it will not be hidden. It will uh, be played out. People will recognize them for who they are and their beliefs 
for who they are because you cannot hide it forever. Uh, and then he goes on to compare them to wandering stars. Now, of course, when we think of a star, we think of something that's someone that's a celebrity. We think of uh, somebody that we, you know, we often want to emulate. But the idea here of a star, uh, it's not just the star, uh, but there's that reference of the darkness. There's the reference of blackness. And you know, when we think of a star, again, it's that juxtaposition of they present themselves to be one thing. They, they want to be a star. They want to be a source of light. But what are the, what's waiting for them? Darkness and blackness. And again, it, it shows um, the invalidity uh, of their position. It shows that, uh, that the, the light that they thought they had really was no light at all. Uh, and sadly, as we see, it says that they will be, uh, for them, it's reserved blackness and darkness. So uh, though they are out there trying to promote and push an agenda, uh, they're going to find themselves sadly uh, distanced from the true light uh, for eternity. So again, this verse, though it has some, you know, as you look at it and read it, it, you know, it, you don't get a really happy, happy, joy, joy sense from it. But again, it's meant to be an encouragement to those that are dealing with people that are teaching false doctrine to remind them that, hey, eventually people are going to recognize their false doctrine for what it is, uh, for who, what they are. And sadly, there are consequences still for this. And so again, we are to be encouraged by this because again, we live in a day, a day in an age where there are many false teachings, many false doctrines. Uh, you know, we are going through election season right now and it's just, I think, 17 days until the election. And uh, I know I will be thankful once this is over. Uh, but, you know, sometimes in election times, uh, we, we hear all kinds of things, all kinds of promises, all kinds of attacks, all kinds of, uh, of just craziness um, from both major political parties. Uh, but eventually, uh, truth will be known. Sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes it takes decades and decades and distance uh, historically uh, for us to really understand and realize the truth. But eventually, it will be made known. As we conclude today, there's a couple things I do want to say. First, today is October 16th, and it is Boston's Day. And as a pastor, I am so blessed to be able to serve the congregation of First Baptist Church in Clay Center. Uh, you know, some people struggle because they have uh, one or two bosses, and when you're a pastor, you have dozens, if not hundreds, of bosses, individuals that you seek uh, to serve and to minister to, to make an impact. Uh, and I have been indeed tremendously blessed over these past 10 years to serve here in Clay Center with this congregation. And I want to take just a moment to truly express and to extend to you my genuine appreciation uh, for all of the ways that you have supported and encouraged our work here at First Baptist Church. I thank also my family. You know, I know it's a strange thing to think of your family as your boss. Um, but again, uh, as an individual, as a father, as a husband, you know, I seek to put the needs of my family ahead of my own to demonstrate Christ-like love. And I have truly been blessed by the family that God has given to me. Have they always made life easy? I don't think I need to answer that question. but. God has indeed blessed me beyond measure. And of course, as a believer in Jesus Christ, as a follower of the way, we know that our true boss is God, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I do just take a moment to thank God for all the blessings, for all the ways that you have worked in my life and I just hope and pray every day that I am able uh, to reflect your grace and mercy 
as I seek to serve my family, my community, our congregation. And so on this Bosses Day, I wish you all the very best. I pray that you know how, how truly I appreciate you all and the way that you do bless me. As we do conclude, we continue to pray through the 50 states as we do prepare for the election. And again, I'm not asking you to pray for a specific outcome. I'm asking you to pray for the will of God. And I'm asking uh, that we as a nation have the grace of God poured out upon us uh, so that we can be one nation under God. Today we think of the state of North Carolina and we pray uh, for those people that God would bless and encourage them uh, that they would seek God's direction uh, as they approach the ballot box. We continue to pray for the confirmation process for Judge Amy Coney Barrett, that again, uh, God's will would be done. And we pray for our nation, that God would indeed uh, be the God of the United States of America, that we as a people would recognize him as such, that he would be glorified in all that we say and do. Thank you so much for joining me today for this Ministry Minute. I look forward to seeing you again real soon here at First Baptist Church in Clay Center, Kansas. And know that we're praying for you and we pray for your family as well.